Do that. Good evening, friends. And you are my friends. I'm starting my next vlog. It's currently 10.26 p.m. I'm going to bed, and I will see you in the morning. Good night. There he is at number two in the top ten, the popular hot dog. Or hot dog and last, though, depending on how you want to refer to it. At number one, the number one contender. You know, now you've mentioned Whoa. hot dog, I'm fucking hungry. Hurry up with this show. I gotta have a lunch, for heaven's sake. Work. I can eat the crotch out of Oprah with some pantyhose right now. I'm so Hello. Good morning, friends. And you are my friends. Uh, I'm ready to go. Wait outside because it's nice out. That's for sure. So, yeah. I really can't see. Bye. At least they never chased me out of the building. They've chased me away from some buildings, but never out of one. That's the one thing I've never seen in my time as a fan. I've heard stories while Bill Curry had happened to in Montreal of fans chasing wrestlers out of the building. Just imagine driving by and you see a wrestler in his trunks running out the front door, followed by the referee, followed by 200 angry fans who then start beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> Uh, well, Jim, let's stay on the topic of wrestling riots because they're great. And this next article is from Beckley, West Virginia. You're old. Oh, good friends. Lord. Yeah, yeah. November 3rd, 1960. Uh, uh, Black Napoleon slugs fan. Wrestling show ends in brawl. Man hurt. A free-for-all broke up a WOAY-TV studio wrestling show Saturday night, which ended with an 85-year-old Eccles man in the Beckley Memorial Hospital. William Thompson, 86, was reported in satisfactory condition today after being tossed around by the Black Napoleon conduct after police said he jumped on the stage and knocked down entertainer Charles Farrell at the Colonial Inn St. Petersburg Beach. Graham posted a $50 bond and was released. Police quoted Graham as saying he was offended by a remark Farrell made on the stage. The wrestler knocked Farrell to the stage floor before being restrained by friends, police said. I know exactly what happened here. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, look at this. This is December 1959. Eddie Graham is one of the top heel tag team champions in New York uh, with the Grahams with Dr. Jerry Graham. He's been main eventing Madison Square Garden. He's now in Florida being featured as a main event guy. He's not out of his 20s yet, but it's a place that he's going to make his, uh, pretty much his uh, home and uh, ended up buying the business, etc., etc. And he goes to a show at, at this Colonial Inn, and whoever this Charles Farrell was, the lounge singer, whoever the fuck, told you a story about when Bill Dundee one time almost got in a fight with Jerry Lee Lewis and his fucking bodyguards in, uh, uh Hernando, Mississippi, for making a uh, something about those phony wrestlers. And Terry Funk just finished telling me a story in uh, when he was a kid, him and Dory, like seven, eight years old, whatever they were, at a restaurant in Amarillo with his dad and uh, some of the wrestlers and their families. When somebody said something about wrestling, he said, I just watched my father just beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> his, and I don't think that guy thought that wrestling was a bunch of shit. That's what they did because that because shit like this got in the fucking paper and people said, well, we're not going to fucking talk bad about those fucking wrestlers or they will beat the fuck out of us. And it, it, it helped for, for quite a while. It was Haku when he bit the nose off the guy's face in Baltimore because the, the guy led with, hey, you phony wrestler. Of Scott Teal. You can access this research, these clips, and so much more by visiting the Crowbar Press archives on Facebook, and you can purchase many of Scott's amazing books by going to crowbarpress.com, the finest in wrestling history, in book form. So check that out, and we thank Scott for all the hard work he does researching these articles. And Jim, the final story this week is from the Minneapolis Star, Tuesday, November 19, 1949. An interesting little article here. Uh, it's, it's actually it's from a larger sports column in the sports section, but uh, Matt Referee Explains. Wrestling breaks into the column as Wally Carbo Referee Explains. It seems like everybody in town has been asking what happened in the Luthez sandor Zabo wrestling match last Tuesday. Here's the way it looked to me as the referee. Sabo slammed Thez with a backdrop, and I could see the boards jump about six inches into the air. What I couldn't see was that when they came down again, there was about a six-inch separation between two boards with nothing but canvas in between. We agree now that Sabo got a bad break, and I think this is the first time in the 5,000 wrestling bouts I've refereed that the ring itself has decided the winner.
Comment from the editor, how often does a sports official admit his error? <laughs> well, this is pretty good. This is a pretty interesting little article here. Wally Carbo, of course, would later be the promoter in Minneapolis. And, and think about this. Think about this. While I worked with Wally Carbo when he was coming out with Tor Berg and the crew from Minneapolis for the LPWA tapings in 1991. This was 1949, and he had already refereed 5,000 wrestling matches and would go on to, uh, to actually be legitimately not only promoter Wally Carbo, but he was pretty much Vern's money partner for Vern to be able to fully buy the what eventually became the AWA. He had been around the business that long. He was just amazing the shit he had seen. I have a feeling he refereed 5,000 wrestling matches just like our next segment. I'm very happy to say someone who listeners have been demanding come back to the show. I was able to talk him into recording a few minutes today for this special anniversary show. Let's go to a conversation with my father. Here on the round table this week, it's bloody Pop cold. Your co-host Jeff Baldrin, Pop your co-host Kurt Brown will be joined by Dave Meltzer oh, of the Wrestling Observer good. Newsletter. Dave really went to good, Japan actually. many times in the really, 80s, really, and he went really once good. with Jeff, and he went and famously I'm freezing in 1990 with Kurt, now. and we're going to have them. And he went a couple of times you, with Dr. Mike tell, Leno sort of. also. Well, Dr. Mike Leno will come up in this conversation, I assure you. So there was a question I just needed to know the answer to. But here's Dave Meltzer, Kurt Brown, and Jeff Bowdrin talking about their experiences in Japan and Japanese wrestling in the 80s overall. Let's now go to the Super Podcast round Yeah. We're going to talk about today's Japanese wrestling, especially in the 80s and the trips you guys took to Japan. And if I can, I'd like to start Never with just your first impressions you. and when you first oh, saw it. Currently and freezing Kurt, my I'll ass start off. With you and for this exercise. And to see them strut half naked. Even the blood is fake. To scare old ladies and dumb kids. Wrestlers think they're so super. Well, they're not. They're just a bunch of chumps who get beaten to entertain lower class criminals. I tell you, if they had any brains, they wouldn't be in such a stupid profession. <laughs> Who cares about them? Who cares if they bleed or die? <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. The blood is was fake in the previous paragraph, and now the injuries are fatal, and he doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You ever notice the kind of dirt that go to wrestling? Not one decent person in the entire arena. All you see are ugly, fat, deformed women and unemployed pimps. Half the goons that watch wrestling can't be shown in public. I ain't never seen a girl at wrestling that dressed decent. <laughs> <laughs> if you're the kid with the big nose that blocks everyone's way with your camera I've done my own investigating when it comes to you I'm not a person with no connections so if basically he goes to the wrestling matches because that way he knows what kind of crowd is there and he also <laughs> knows that Brian is the guy that blocks his way with the camera okay oh, wait a minute. as for Steve Kern I challenge that evil punk to a tape fist match. I'll even I guarantee you this motherfucker just sight unseen. This motherfucker did not want to be in a tape fist match with me. <laughs> I'll even pay the chumpy chicken to face me. He may be great in fixed matches, but let the real man, me, emerge in a she real match. approaches you, slap her! <laughs> I think Malcolm will have the good sense to know a man from a bug. She knows that Worm Kern can never afford her. He doesn't make that much money. Besides, he can't handle a real woman. He probably has these little half-wit N-word teeny boppers oh, running Jesus after Christ. him and that harpooned walrus Rhodes. Well, that just escalated quickly. <laughs> Fuck. And now, but also, the, the fucking girl that he loves and pays for and wants to keep, he's just invited a, a, a grown man and a professional wrestler to fucking slap her on sight. <laughs> then, then he, he turns around and, and, and shows racist tendencies against uh, Kern, and somehow uh, Dusty is involved in this. And closes with, I'll tell you, no decent woman would turn the boys here. Mal Malka has moved. Don't even try selling your cheap shots to her by mail. Signed, and there's not even a, a regards or a yours truly. It's just a name there. Purnell W. Beecham. Well, number five in the top ten, the Black Scorpion. 
Jim, any final thoughts on the trials and tribulations of Malka Rabinowitz and Purnell? What'd you say? Uh, uh, Beecham, Beecham. Okay. Beecham. Uh, I, no, I seriously, those two crazy kids, star-crossed lovers, I hope they finally worked everything out. But I have a feeling that Steve Kern probably bent her over and dog-fucked her until she fucking squealed bloody murder and Purnell got more and more fucking upset about it by the second. She also has the most Jewish name I've ever heard of anyone involved with wrestling. Malka Rabinowitz. Rabinowitz. That's a, that's a winner there. But number five, the Black Scorpion. Or, or Gasmic Larry Nelson. Well, you know, Larry, he just has such a full-throated uh, release from his tension, so to speak. It's just, he's all into it. And I think that's why he's popular time and time again, because people can, can detect the authenticity, the genuineness in his exclamation of, of orgasmic uh, delight. Look out, Barry Von Reisky! Oh, jeez, old gravity! <laughs> <laughs> He really is just incredible. Everything he says is hysterical. When you watch him, he's he's always like moving. Like his whole body I mean he's on Coke. I mean that's part of the reason. But he's and then it's like making facial expressions and just acting goofy and he's someone who everyone hated back then but it's so much fun to watch him now and you realize that so many of the commentators Ed Whalen stays where he is but someone like Larry Nelson who we thought of as being substandard in the 80s he would be one of the best guys in the wrestling Life. business so and, and that wrestling is no exception well there he is at number 4 this week in the top 10 orgasmic Larry Nelson are we having fun people? no I at number three in the top ten, disappointed Lance Russell. Ah, look out! Jim, what's the funniest Lance Russell story you know? Oh, good Lord. Now, see, it, now, it, as my mom would say, you've scared it out of me. Uh, anything I say now will be a, uh, 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 you know, the funniest thing you ever said. But no, uh, Lance, the beauty of Lance's style was that he could contribute to the funny situations and make them funnier by being the straight guy and being serious and being the, because he was in the scene you believed it was what was right, it was a fucking it was a as only would say a dog and pony show but because of Lance it worked so Lance was often unintentionally funny with that that grace ah oh, you know come on now Jerry yeah well we told you you when he pitched to the to the big midget match coming up after the break or you know or or was selling Homer Odell when he had a bucket of yellow paint turned over his head but Lance was the was you know your your next door neighbor or your favorite uncle or you know as, as time went on your grandfather that was trying to ride legitimate herd and be this you know announcer and and friendly you know but professional television guy with all this fucking chaos and all this goddamn lunatics bouncing around him so it just that's I, Lance was the whole anchor of the thing and the whole reason why that it worked and and if you go back and look it, the the corny jokes that he might crack were never really funny Mission <laughs> doctor oh god well yeah um there's several uh, it, they, they've saved and the reason why is just because you know it was so funny that people were fucking with lance and he had such great you know responses he'd crack right up but the al costello was doing a local promo one time and was telling fart jokes in Memphis, and they saved that, and Lawler had it, and I ended up uh, copying it from him when I got my first VCR. I borrowed all of his tapes, and, but one of them, uh, it, it, they shot this in Evansville when Lance had to be there to shoot something for some reason, and there was in uh, in Evansville in those days, this was like 1977-ish. There was a guy named Doc Schrieffer was this old, I mean, he was so old, my God, he was ready to turn into dust. Uh, his birth certificate was chiseled in stone. He was just ancient. And he was the athletic commission doctor. And basically, he would sit there, it, it, hunched over in his chair at a table with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and take the guy's... Well, you know, I... <laughs> I boxed a little, you know, and we know how to fall, you know, and Lawler's starting to crack up worse. And finally, Lance says, well, I understand when they get slammed over and over time and time again, that some of them, and from the car trips, and also they, they tend to, they get hemorrhoids, Doc, right? And and the doctor goes, oh, well, I don't know about, you know, about that. 
And then Lawler runs over in front of Lance and bends over his stick and pulls his pants down and sticks his ass in front of the doctor and says, he sticks his finger up our ass. <laughs> so it checks to see if we have any. <laughs> and the doctor turns red and Lance is fucking laughing. It just, he was great with that because he could, from his years hosting in radio and television for 40 years, he could have a conversation with anybody. And he'd lull you into a false sense of security. And if, you know, but I'm sure Lawler put him up to it because Lance wouldn't rib anybody on purpose, but I think he went along with it to, you know, to. Uh... <laughs> well, that's number three in the top 10 this week. Disappointed Lance Russell. I don't want to see you around here anymore. Will you get that stupid fool out of here? Tell him in Mexican just to get out of here. At number three this week in the top 10 is Hot Dog or Hot Dog in Last. This week, this week is the always popular Hot Dog. And I believe Double, he's... double, double. There he is. Hey, happy thanks grinning there, partner. <laughs> happy thanks grinning to you too. Yeah, Turkey Day is here at the mighty 605 FM. Yeah. You know, I think Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday of the whole year, man. Well, maybe next to Christmas and my birthday, but it's right up there. Don't you agree, TGBL? It's it's all right. There's a lot of good food. It's okay. I like having a couple days wait, at home. Wait a minute. You're you're Jewish, aren't you, Booby? <laughs> I am. Do you celebrate Thanksgiving? <laughs> yes, there's no restrictions on Thanksgiving celebration. You do? Oh, okay. Huh. I stand corrected. Well, cool. You know, the food, you know, the parades and the football, it's a special time of year here at the station when I think we have a regular cornucopia of things to give thanks for, don't we? I sure do. What Not do you too have? shabby. <laughs> no. I predicted it. I predicted it. Number two, nowhere to go but up, my friend. Oh, well, I guess we could go down. Uh, whoa. <laughs> well, you know what else I'm thankful for? I'm also thankful for comedy wrestling and the strides that goofy gimmicks and exaggerated dopey facial expressions and cheap merchandising have made and continue to make. I think 2018 <laughs> is going to be the biggest year ever, a real watershed year in comedy wrestling. If you thought 2017 was ridiculous, just wait. Oh, that's, not, think, that's, that's not very promising. <laughs> Dog, that's not promising no. at all. Well, I say that as a comedy gimmick character in all seriousness. <laughs> hey, I mentioned parades earlier. Yeah, you did. You know, the 605 Supercast Thanksgiving Day Parade is going by the station right now. Can you hear it? <laughs> the Supercast Thanksgiving Parade? I don't know what you're yeah, talking it's about. It's by on the street right by our station. No, there's no station. Oh, look at that. Stuffing and cranberry sauce coming at you. Since Thanksgiving is a, the kickoff to the holiday season, may I read one of my favorite Christmas stories on the air? I don't think we have time for that this week, Hot Dog, but maybe in the future. Uh, it's a tradition on the show that I... No, no it's not I'm a tradition. I'm starting it this year. Well, yeah, we've never done this tradition. It's a tradition on this show. All right, Hot Dog, uh, we, will, we will have your Christmas story in the future on the show, I promise you, before Christmas. But any last uh, words this week for the 605ers as we wrap up this program of yours and move on with the top ten? Thanks, everybody, for uh, getting our ratings spiked up there to the number two show in town. And I wanted to thank you most of all, TGBL, uh, my good pal Lasto, and tell you, uh, tell the paper bag assassin that I'll be over at about uh, 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day. Don't forget to save a place for me. Hey, Brian, we gotta go. <laughs> Very Hurry up with this show. I gotta have lunch, for heaven's sake. I could eat the crotch out of Oprah Winfrey's pantyhose right now. I'm so hungry. You mentioned hot dogs. You like Nathan's? Uh, Na oh, Nathan's are very tasty. I couldn't, I couldn't eat them after dipping them in a glass of water like old Kobayashi and and uh, like the Larry Bud Melman or who's the other fucking guy? What's his name? God damn it! It's not Larry Bud Melman. <laughs> I know. What <laughs> helped me out? With Joey the, Chestnut. Joey Chestnut. Yes, I couldn't do it. I would do it. That would the bun would be too soggy. I always loved that Letterman on the very first episode at CBS at 11.30. He opened it with the big CBS eye, and then the middle fell out. And there was Larry Bud Melman, and he's like, this is CBS! <laughs> <laughs> Which was perfect. If you were a Letterman fan, it was the perfect way to usher into the new era of the show. But once again, number two in the top ten, Hot Dog. At number one in the top 10, which makes him the number one contender, which means next week you get the vote on this man versus the champion, Brother Midnight. It is girl last night. I had no idea they were into plumbing. Denim words of wisdom. 
If you're gonna crank your rod in front of a broad, make sure she's okay with it before whipping it out. The rumors about my boys being provided with hookers at the NWA convention are not true. It was Jim Barnett and Drag. <laughs> I once told my boy Kerry he couldn't leave his room until he learned how to tie his shoes. I didn't see him for six months. I am jealous I don't get five-star matches. From this point forward, the Iron Claw is now the Meltzer Claw. And my wrestling arena is now the Meltzatorium. I feel more stars coming already. <laughs> and those are the tweets of Denim Fritz for this oh, week. Oh, good lord. The number one contender. For the record, you can hear what cracked Jim Cornette up and what didn't, so you know where his sense of humor is nowadays. Number one, Denim Fritz. Yes, right now. Well, let me just tell you something before I get into that, baby, because I do have to take on the with a little bit of the summer brother midnight rhymes, baby, are not authentic, baby, not original, baby. And I heard this over the email, oh, baby. I don't spend a lot of time online, baby, with online communities, baby. Frankly, I don't understand it, baby. So people tell me over the email, baby, the fax machine is not working anymore. I graduated to the email. A picture of uh, probably, uh, if it was Mike O'Hara, maybe Benji Ramirez or, Ramirez or uh, if whatever. But regardless, he seems a bit obsessive already. Yeah, and obviously this whole letter is in caps. And this is the first time... I noticed been... that, yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's typed on an actual desktop typewriter because it's 1982, and it's everything is in capitals. He talks about all the various names that O'Hara wrote back to him, that he called him in this letter, that he returned back to him. The next <laughs> person, listen, do you know this person, Terrence Machalik? Uh, yeah, yeah, he uh, worked out of uh, Canada. Was It wasn't Toronto, was it Winnipeg, perhaps? Uh, but wait, here is a wild one. Sends the petition back torn up in a fit of rage. Typical irrational sort of act. Uh, doesn't bother me, though. I have a nice little surprise for old cranky TM. Uh, he won't measure up to Gene Gordon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah, Bounty well, Hunters, a.k.a. the Novaks. I say no ropes, I get ropes. I, that used to be a big thing. They wanted pictures with no ropes in the way. I also get a sheep herder photo that is terrible. He says the negative of Buzz Sawyer is destroyed, yet it is on his list. That's wild, Howard, isn't it? Then he calls me insane. <laughs> Ridiculous. Believes I have a complex because I think someone has been laying a bum rap on me. Yet I send two photos back and he rips me off for a dollar fifty. Who's giving me a bum rap, Howard? You grovel over that a little. A <laughs> dollar fifty. He's getting so upset about. Uh, there are a few other people here. Laura Zofka, John oh, Lawson. I remember Laura Zofka. Yes, yes. She was a lovely, uh, well, oh, a woman, but certainly not a lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Wait a minute. She tries to compare me to Iranians. <laughs> Maybe after. Bye. That and and actually may still have been technically on paper the owner, but can it? Oh, the the Superman that that he was on the cover of? Yeah, Superman versus Rocket. Yes, because I mentioned that, and and I got three of them in the mail from from Cult of Cornet members. It was and and I appreciate every single one of them, but especially the one that was in really nice shape. But it was amazing that, that I've never I because I mentioned I'd never seen it. I'd heard about it but never seen it, and all the time I'd collect the comics that and then boom. There it was, so you never know. You know what I have on vinyl that I think you probably don't have? This. Go on the rest. I'm pretty sure you don't have that. <laughs> Len Goza? A boss told I... him that Green is good to be model for Cedric of Hollywood, but it's kind of nasty. Be the last one. I do not have that. No, no, I don't. Uh, they were they were wonderfully musical, Dad. I came from the Memphis territory where, you know, they Memphis, every, you know. The... For the record. But I am going to be at the top of the heap when the top 10 rankings come out by Thanksgiving. By Thanksgiving. And by the way, <laughs> thank you for waiting two years into your run to contact 
the most all around. First man to eat a salami sandwich while running a triathlon. <laughs> First man to eat chicken tetrazzini <laughs> while scaling Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on, hold on, magnificent one. Let's uh, get it straight. What did you say? You were the first man to to eat a what? You know damn well what I did. <laughs> I was the first man to eat a BLT while impregnating Anne Margaret. <laughs> what? Look it up, 1974. All right, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. I once ate a tray of lasagna while riding the biggest wave. I'm a North Shore. <laughs> I have done, I'm the innovator. I have done so many food and strenuous activity combinations, it would make your head. I have eaten caviar while detailing my car. Okay. All right. I All right. am the first man to eat a banana. I'm dipping them in the warm waters of Sunset Beach, which is a real place, by the way. And I would not take myself away from the slim and slender fingertips of all the ladies who like to oil up my big coconut sized shoulders. But I come to you with a very important announcement today. Coconut size. And this might be a little bit out of character. So listen up if you will. All right. I am here to talk about something very near and dear to my heart today. And it's a little bit out of character, but I think it's important. I have been appointed the head of the Ernie Roth Memorial Clinic for oral hygiene for the indigent. <laughs> what the, the Ernie Roth, the Grand Wizard Clinic for oral hygiene for the indigent? For the indigent. <laughs> what? Give it back to the community. Give it back to the community. And you can check it out. It's a real clinic. We are currently accepting old bridge work, gold teeth, bronze teeth, partials, oh, right. bridges, it's, attention. It sounds like you accept everything, but how can the listeners get in touch with uh, this charity that you're claiming that you're now the PR person for? It's very simple. 22 Acahuco Lane. Maybe I should spell that out for you people, for you people in the main What was it, Acahuco? 22 Acahuco Lane. Okay, how do you spell that? Okay, you got your pens and pencils? Get ready. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm home. My hair is done. Got my dinner. After, which means I'm many my vlogs. See ya.